Welcome again to White TV, William Engdahl. We are sitting here in Stockholm still, mm -hmm. and uh, you have a huge variety of publications. Um, uh, for me, you have been known mostly for your oil research, which is very valuable. But um, um, you could perhaps explain what is the, are the leading thoughts in your research. I realized this after I'd written two of my books. I've written now seven. The seventh, I just completed the manuscript and sent it to uh, two different publishers in different countries. Is that there's a common thread that runs unconsciously, and now it's conscious, quite conscious, through all of my books, and that is the misuse of power. Mm -hmm. And I look at it on a global scale on what the British hundred and uh, some years ago, well, uh, hundred and ten years ago, Sir Halford Mackinder uh, published a book called The uh, Geographical Pivot of History, and that was the foundation of British geopolitics. You had, uh, in Sweden, you had Schillen, and uh, in, in What's German, the name in Sweden? Schillen, K-J-E-L-L-E-N. Uh, he, was, he was also very much thinking in terms of geography and politics and political power and mm -hmm. which nations uh, emerged. For example, England was a sea power. The, the Dutch earlier were sea power. And uh, they were able to create a global empire by controlling the sea lanes. Uh, Angl uh, America is an island power, uh, much bigger in landmass than, than Great Britain, and uh, for that reason was able to emerge after World War I and World War II as the dominant uh, power to replace the British Empire as it went into decline. So uh, I, partly from reasons of my own life experience as a child, uh, realized that, that I became quite animated and motivated to try to help ordinary people see what's been done to manipulate our lives by analyzing the misuse of power by very powerful people in this world. And uh, that's, that's more or less what guides my book. There, there was a quote in the 1970s attributed to Henry Kissinger. This was at the time, if you recall, of the great oil shock, uh, 1973-74 and the price of oil went up 400 percent in a period of months. At the same time, the price of grain on the world market went up 300, 350, 400 percent. And Henry Kissinger, who at that point was probably the most powerful man in Washington, yeah. a protege of the Rockefellers, made the comment uh, that if you control oil, you control entire nations. If you control food, you control the people. And if you control money, you control the entire world. This, in a nutshell, and I've written a trilogy uh, exactly based on, the, on this notion of control by these powerful elites, the century of war, uh, Anglo-American oil power is the first, control of oil. The seeds of destruction, hidden agenda of genetic manipulation is the food control, agribusiness. And the third is the gods of money, Wall Street, and the American century yeah. is the control of money. And you have to look at these processes historically from the standpoint of control and power and power games. Uh, and uh, that's, to my mind, the real issue of geopolitics. Uh, I don't look, I'm an economist by education, but mostly by my own education over decades. Uh, and I studied politics at university years ago pretty much uh, wasted time in terms of academic uh, politics because <laughs> the real uh, world politics works in a very, very different way. Uh, but uh, to combine, to look at economics as a thing in itself, politics as a thing in itself, such as you have in universities with this uh, bizarre discipline called international relations, uh, I think doesn't get at anything useful as to how the world works. And that that's my fascination. And if, if my writings do a little something to open people's eyes, ordinary people's eyes, who otherwise don't have the time to dedicate to the in-depth research, and I, I've been gifted that I have certain capabilities to look at certain things, and I'm trying to use that as best I can for the benefit of mankind. And, and uh, 
that's what connects, I would say, connects the various books that I write. Yes. Uh, it's kind of a, a moral, uh, emotional, uh, human uh, realization on certain themes that this has to be clarified and uh, it results in, in uh, what comes out in my books. Do you can pinpoint who wants to get this control? It goes in levels, like going up a, uh, up a pyramid to the top. And you have many different organizations of control in the world. You have uh, numerous branches of Freemasonry. I think one of the uh, identifiably uh, most evil at the higher levels is the Scottish Rite Freemasonry yes. headquarters in, Wa in Washington today. Albert Pike's organization, who founded the Ku Klux Klan and a few other nice things. Uh, you have uh, many, many different things. You have the uh, Jesuit order, the Society of Jesus uh, in the Catholic Church. Yeah. You have uh, the Muslim Brotherhood in, in Islam, which is a Freemason-like death cult. It's, it's, it's nothing else but a death cult, mm -hmm. supported by the Obama administration, yeah. most most directly, most openly, uh, and you have so you have many different levels of this. You have organizations of, of uh, powerful elite families with names such as the Bilderberg Meeting or the Trilateral Commission or uh, uh, this one and that one, but uh, the Davos World Economic Forum. These are simply uh, quasi-public, middle-level meeting points or, or strategy and, and uh, consensus can be shaped among very, very powerful elites. I think you have about, uh, one, one study I'm familiar with, you have about 147 global corporations at the top of this pyramid of controlling the wealth of the planet yeah. and those are primarily dominated by financial institutions such as uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, Goldman Sachs, the yeah. uh, Fidelity Fund in Boston, the mutual, enormously huge mutual funds, State Street Bank, uh, Barclays in, in London and so forth. And through the cross shareholdings uh, of that you, you control... BlackRock. Uh, as well. That you control uh, the overwhelming physical assets of the world. And, and this is the driving force behind so-called economic globalization. Uh, lifting any national protections, any national barriers, and just overrunning uh, the world so you concentrate power at the top. But that's also on a working level. So where, where it goes above that, uh, one can speculate. I, you know, I've read many things over the years, but I think uh, it's important for real people who have to go through life uh, dealing with real problems that they have names and institutions that they can tangibly uh, view and see, okay, this makes sense, and look at what they're doing. Uh, above that, it's speculation, in my view. It is said they want the total power over the whole planet. Would you agree with that plan? Sure. I wouldn't agree with the plan, but I would yeah, agree with the analysis. Yeah, yeah. The, I, I wrote a book called Full Spectrum Dominance, and uh, uh, the Pentagon has a doctrine that's operational today called full spectrum dominance. And what it means in military terms is domination of the planet, land, sea, air, airspace, air control, outer space, and cyberspace. In other words, control of everything everywhere. And I think the uh, through the food weapon, uh, they want to control uh, human life on this planet in, in a very uh, uh, sinister way. Uh, they want to uh, use synth creation of synthetic religious ideologies to control spiritual life on this planet, yeah. to create a one world religion. That's been the Rockefeller dream for more than a century. Mm -hmm. uh, that would essentially make them zombies of their institutions or slaves of their institutions mentally. So it's, it's uh, and I for one uh, don't like the idea of uh, some sinister force or even benevolent force controlling everything about my life. I, I, uh, 
I think human beings, the diversity and creativity is what's precious. Not not that we're all marching in lockstep like the uh, People's Liberation Army in the days of Mao or something like that, or the uh, the jackboots of Hitler's SS. Yeah, yeah. And what do you think? How far have they succeeded to control the whole planet? I think we're in a fascinating juncture right now, where everything is up for grabs. And more than that, I cannot say. That's that's my gut feeling. And I've been doing this kind of research uh, as an historian, as a political economist, as a, a human being for more than 38 years of my life. And I've never seen such a fascinating time in, in the history that I've been here on this planet. And uh, I think. Uh, the surprising is more likely than the predictable. Yeah, for me, uh, Putin and his Russia is a, a stone against uh, th those uh, efforts to, to take the total control of the planet. Well, it's it's a uh, it's complicated. I think uh, Putin's uh, personal impulses, and I'm generally quite positive about uh, what Putin has done in terms of resisting this global uh, military trend toward a global fascism or universal fascism, as some people around uh, Washington call it. Uh, let's be honest, Putin comes out of a culture of the KGB, mm -hmm. and uh, that sometimes is a fairly brutal culture. Yes. Uh, the Russian experience going back uh, centuries is, is, a, is a difficult, tough, brutal culture. And yet I have a tremendous affection for Russian people. I have many friends who are Russian in, in Russia and in the West and Europe. Uh, and I think basically what what is urgently necessary is a counter pole to this one superpower control of everything. Yes. And what's evolving, and I've written about this uh, over years, what's evolving is a coalition, a Mackinder, if you will, a Halford Mackinder nightmare. Mackinder talked about the uh, heartland power, excuse me, uh, by which he meant Russia, and the island power, which he meant the British Empire. He was a, a diehard uh, British imperialist. And he said, we have to make sure that Central Europe and the heartland do not come together in a coalition because the power that controls that combination of Central Europe and the heartland, Russia, can control the world island, as he calls it, which includes China, India, Central Asia, and so forth, the Middle East, and who controls the world island can control the world. Now Brzezinski, who is a big new Brzezinski, who's a disciple of Mackinder, mentions it in his books, uh, echoes that in his 1997 The Grand Chess Game, where he, or The Grand Chess Board rather, where he talks about the only potential rival to American hegemony in the world are the nations of Eurasia. They have the population, they have the technological base, the education, uh, and the natural resources to be totally independent and create a counterpole. And that's what I think the world needs right now. Yes. The future of Europe economically does not lie to the West as it maybe yes. did uh, in the 1880s, 1890s, when Sweden looked to the West or into the early 1900s, looked to America as, as the future. That has been destroyed uh, to all intents and purposes by, by these financial elites that have uh, taken power over Washington. Uh, the gods of money, I call them, in one title of one of my books. The uh, the future lies for Europe to the east, yeah. to the cooperative development of infrastructure, of entire new markets, new areas, new regions, mm -hmm. uh, between Eastern Europe, between Russia, between uh, the Middle East, Iran. And I sometimes speak of a uh, an iron triangle of, of Moscow, Tehran, and Beijing. Yeah. Uh, those three are tending to be pushed together, even though they may not have intended it uh, 10 or 15 years ago, by Washington policy. 
Yes. And out of that, I think, could become, could evolve a genuine economic counterpole and military counterpole that could neutralize this threat to the planet right now. We'll see how that evolves. But I think what Putin has been doing uh, on the missile defense, I have written a book about this full spectrum dominance, in fact, uh, that uh, Putin is absolutely correct when he says this is the most aggressive nuclear first strike policy that the United States is advancing against Russia. Agree. And uh, what Putin has done uh, in terms of the Ukraine, everything that the Russians have claimed is documentably true. The neoconservatives in Washington, Victoria Newlands, uh, who became rather infamous for her comment, fuck the EU, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, they managed a coup d'etat to dislodge a democratically elected president, Yanukovych, even though one might not uh, like him or whatever. What business is it of Washington to decide who's going to be the unelected uh, uh, dictator of, of Ukraine and bring in they can kill uh, almost 100 people with their snipers uh, to get their will through. The, well, this is, this is quite a shocking story that uh, very few people are aware of. I, I documented this some uh, weeks, some days after, after the coup d'etat on, on February 22nd of this year. And that is that uh, after Victoria Newland's infamous uh, fuck the EU uh, comments to the ambassador in Kiev, uh, the European Union uh, began to say, oh, wait a minute now, let's see if we can avoid, avoid a uh, catastrophe on the borders of NATO. Uh, the foreign ministers of Germany, of Poland, a bordering country to Ukraine, and uh, of, of France. France went to Kiev in the days before the uh, agreement of the 21st of February. and. They made intensive round-the-clock negotiations with all three opposition parties, Klitschko, uh, Tannebock, and, and uh, the uh, current Prime Minister's party, and uh, with Yanukovych. They had a, there was a Russian observer there as an observer, not as a voting member. And they finally came up with a compromise agreement that they could all live with, elections in December of this year, 2014 and reversion to the Constitution of 2004, various other things. They went out to Maidan Square and held it up to a vote of the occupying protesters, and it, they approved it as well. There was only one major power that was not invited to this meeting, and this is, tells volumes, and that was Washington, the United States. Victoria Newland was not invited. Twelve hours later, what's now been uh, proven to be snipers uh, in the building controlled by the neo-Nazi Ukrainian uh, Pravi sector, the, the security for the Maidan Square, uh, snipers began opening fire on, on the occupiers and simultaneously on the police yes. to create absolute panic and the agreements broke down. Yanukovych fled in, in, in fear of his life and, and uh, the, uh, essentially, it was a coup d'état, a military coup d'état run by NATO snipers or NATO trained snipers, uh, all evidence uh, that I've been able to find. And literally, uh, some people call them not even neo Nazis, they, they are de facto uh, Nazis in every exactly. way, shape, and form. Yes. Uh, the Ukrainian National Assembly and, and their defense arm. And these people have been involved in. NATO dirty wars in Chechnya after the dissolution of the Soviet Union against Russia and uh, numerous other places in Georgia and so forth. Yes, yes. And they didn't give a damn on the constitution of the Ukraine because... Well, they don't give a damn on anything. <laughs> they're, uh, they're beasts, essentially. Uh, uh, Neo-Nazi, uh, uh, you know, they just... And you, you can see videos. I published an article on the internet uh, some, uh, some weeks ago where video clips that have, uh, many of them have been removed uh, because they're embarrassing, but where these thugs that are now the government of Ukraine come in to the director of Ukrainian uh, television station yes. and start just beating him up because he published a news fact broadcast about the referendum of the uh, people in Crimea where they overwhelmingly voted for annexation with Russia.
And yesterday reports came that uh, Greystone sent 150 soldiers, quote, uh, uh, to, to liberate uh, the, the eastern part of the Ukraine. Yeah. You heard that as well? Uh, I've been traveling, so I haven't heard that specifically, but I, I saw a headline that there was something of that sort. So. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, the Ukrainians can't handle their own uh, security, it seems. <laughs> and um, um, uh, when it comes to control, that is your topic. Um, why is control needed in the eyes of those uh, having already so much money that they can buy everything they want? Well, they can't. They can't. And uh, that's what makes us human beings human beings and, and them uh, inhuman beings, as I would, I would call it. They can't control life. They can't. Uh, there's something called the human spirit that uh, no amount of money can buy. The only thing they can do is create institutions that create fear among us. And we have one thing as, as human beings, as living human beings, authentic, real human beings, and that is the power to love. And that terrifies them. It mm. scares the devil out of them. Yes. Because they've never had the emotion of love in their own childhood, in their own lives, yes. as far as I, I can judge by any yes. experiences that I've had over, yes. Yes. over my lifetime. And that's, uh, that's something that terrifies them. And thank you very much. Thank you. It was very thrilling to listen to you. Hey, <laughs> <Hey> do. <laughs>